Welcome to Bowties in Business, where a fashionable nerd and knowledge meet. Regardless of whether your career is just starting, steady, or stalling, join me and a collection of business and thought leaders who are experts in their field as they share their decades of first-hand real-world experience from the ground floor to the executive suite and every corner of the business world. Hi, welcome back and thanks for listening. I'm your host, Tim Kubiak. If you like what you hear, please hit the subscribe button. You can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, as well as a host of other podcast things. If you want to know more, you can always head over to timkubiak.com for the bonus content. And with that, we're going to jump into today's topic. It's overcoming call reluctance. Call reluctance isn't a term everyone may know. So it's literally the fear of picking up the phone and reaching out to a customer or prospect. Now, most often it's associated with sales, but as we talk through this, there will be cases where you see other parts of a business are affected, but primarily we're going to focus on sales. So a lot of times call reluctance is something that gets pegged to newer people or people that, as the saying goes, simply don't have what it takes to make it in sales. You know, seasoned sales professionals and some do not ever have call reluctance. Some have worked through it, right? But even some of the great ones have times where they make calls that aren't, you know, necessarily the ones they should be making and reach out and proactively building the business. You know, so what is call reluctance in a little more detail? It's nothing more than not making a call. In this case, we're going to talk mostly about calling over the phone, although there are times where people do go either door to door or show up at businesses, you know, without an appointment to try to get in. And that can be a form of call reluctance. It's not just the sales professionals and the newbies, you know, that this happens to. Even some of the greatest hunters occasionally, and hunters meaning new business development and new customer acquisition people, put off reaching out or making contact with customer or prospect. And that's a challenge because at the end of the day, totally impacts your sales. Now, if we look at the other parts of an organization, you know, and everyone goes, oh, salespeople make all the calls. That's actually not completely true. If you look, the collections and receivables department, they have to reach out to customers. And increasingly, we see them hiding behind email and hiding behind things. And I've been in a couple of situations where they didn't proactively reach out to anyone via the phone. They just thought that that was insane and then didn't understand why they weren't getting responses from customers or weren't getting full explanations. They're losing the opportunity to have the conversation. Other areas that are guilty of it at times can be service departments or logistics departments. They they don't have a component or a part. You know, they don't get to a customer problem quickly, you know, or they have to deliver bad news. Sometimes they avoid making the call or put it off. Now, it's not a good business practice, but it is a reality. So managers have to install systems and teams, you know, that make sure that those calls are made, that those customers are communicated with and all the way through. Now, kind of going back to the salesperson's version of call reluctance, and we're going to focus on that the rest of the way out today. What causes call reluctance? There's a whole variety of things, and there's probably as many different reasons for call reluctance is there are people and sellers that have it. But some of the common ones are, what if I don't know all the answers? Newer salespeople are often unsure. They're afraid to get asked a question they don't know the answer to. Where a seasoned sales veteran will be, I don't know, I'll get back to you. And that's always a legitimate answer. Now look, if they ask you your name or your phone number and you don't know it, it's a problem. But if it's a technical question, if it's a specification, if it's something like that, that's not a reason not to call. Actually, that's a great reason to show that you're trustworthy, that you're going to go get the correct answer and reach back out to the customer. The other ones, you know, what if they're mean? Well, you know, you're right. Sometimes when you're calling people, even in a business to business situation, you'll get somebody on the other end of the phone that's a jerk. But more often than not, if you approach them reasonably, directly and with a good message, people are going to listen to you. They may not want what you're offering at the time. And that odds of that first contact leading to something more, you know, oftentimes you do have to reach out over and over again to get a business relationship established, to generate their interest. So have some asks, make it simple, get them engaged. And if a person's mean, that's fine. 
call them in three weeks, right? You don't have to call them back, but most people, you put them in a rotation, you circle them back. You caught them on a bad day, you caught something else going on. If the guy's truly a jerk, then you're right. You probably shouldn't be selling to them. But don't make that just based on a first call and an abrupt announcement. You know, I've seen reps sit there, stare at the phone, and go, oh, they're not going to pick up anyway. Well, you know what? You're right. People are busy. You're interrupting them with a call. That's a terrible, immoral thing to do. Now that's crap, okay? So people are busy. The call is unexpected. So if they don't pick up, have a message, have a compelling voicemail message, you know, have a reason that they want to call you back. Even if it's a customer you know, you need those things. So it's a good practice to have all the time. Now, a few words of caution, right? Um, Modern technology has made it so these robotic dialers, these scam calls and whatnot, make it so more and more people aren't answering their phones. And, and that is true. And that's why it's equally important to have multiple contact numbers when possible to get a hold of somebody and to also have a strong message when you call. Because if they dump you right in the voicemail, and it may happen, have a compelling reason, start to establish yourself and your name and your reason for calling, and just move on to the next one and come back around to that person. Now, often in the, you hear a rep, I'm not sure of the value. Well, first of all, the value is not, never what your company says it is, it's what the customer says it is. But beyond that point, you know, if you don't know the value of what you're selling, the features and benefits and how it helps the customer, go do your homework, but then pick up the phone. Right. Again, the customer is the only one who can tell you what the real value is, but you have to understand your product. You have to have baseline knowledge. As we talked about early, you don't have to have every answer, but you have to know where it fits and why it might help them. Now, there's other options too, right? And in many cases, as with sales getting more technical around technology and even other components and in industries, you'll have an engineering person or a system design person that's part of it, and they can help articulate some of the value, in which case your value to the company is to get the meeting, get in front of them, and really learn what the customer's needs are. Times have changed, and technology is a great thing, but it's also caused some non-traditional forms of call reluctance I've seen with people I've coached in the past couple of years. The first one is getting ready to get ready. Once upon a time, the joke was, you know, you got a job, they handed you a list of customers, prospects, or suspects, which somebody they suspect might someday buy something, or the yellow pages and say, here, go build a business, kid. You have, you know, you have everybody in the zip code. You have this, you have that. And there is still a bit of that. However, now there's so many tools for researching customers, for understanding the company, their credit rating, their size, who their officers are, who their sales leaders are. And if your company's providing you with those, that's fantastic, right? And there are even ones that go in and say, let's look at their social media profiles. Let's look at their LinkedIn profiles. That's great. Have as much information as you can succinctly, but don't paralyze yourself with data. Don't get ready to get ready so you're ready to call eventually, someday, kind of, sort of. Create a system for yourself where you can get the information you need for those initial contacts and conversations efficiently and effectively and make the dials. I watched a rep one time spend two weeks getting ready to make the first 20 phone calls. He knew everything about everybody he was calling except what they were buying or why they might buy it. So again, don't get caught up information overload. You know, have relevant information, create your own system and be efficient. Yeah, that might take a little bit of time, but it's a good thing to do. The next thing is is, is the email trap. And I'm going to do a whole separate piece on this down the road. But so often people are hiding behind emails. And I'll pick on millennials specifically in this one, right? I see millennials at the desk. Oh, I sent an email. No shit, you sent an email. Do you know how many unsolicited emails I read and I'm in sales, Right. So the, the answer is, is email is a great way to continue a conversation. If you already have a relationship, it is a great way to confirm an order, quantities, options, convey information like tracking numbers, and at times a follow-up email after a conversation or a meeting is an extremely powerful tool. But sending a blind email into somebody, the chances it's going to get more than a three-second look in any real consideration, emails are impersonal. And I know there's entire industries built on 
automated emails and things like that. And I use some in my business too, but it's when people request information. So we're going to talk about the email trap, not falling into it when it comes to selling. Another one, and this one I actually, I fall in prey to. I've seen some great sellers fall prey to, and sometimes it's just you're having a bad day or you're off. And instead of making the hard calls to either difficult customers or prospects you really need to reach, but you haven't, you spend the day making safe calls. And every so often, it's okay. You call your best customers, you know, not really for the best reason, but they'll talk to you because they're your friends and they give you business and everything. So instead of calling friendlies and making, you know, you know, make inroads, do the hard calls, even, even on those days, you know, and then have a purpose for your call. If we have an ongoing business relationship and you know it was, you know, I had something going on or whatever, your customer had something going on on the weekend, it's fine to call in and talk a little bit about that. But generally just calling to check in is a waste of time. Now, this isn't necessarily a call reluctance thing, but I see reps do it all the time. Hey, I'm calling to check in. You got anything for me? Nope, Bob, go away. I don't, right? And the reality is, is the check-in call has a purpose as long as the call has a purpose. And there are times where it's just part of relationship building, but that still should have a bit of an agenda, should have a bit of a flow, should have some business reason behind it. And then the last thing I'm going to tell you is one of the best ways to get over call reluctance is to set aside dedicated time. Don't make the dials because a manager tells you you have to. Make the dials and figure out how to work the system to grow your business and put money in your pocket because everything at the end of the day is about growing your own business and being successful for yourself. The numbers the company sets are because they're trying to attain an objective. Your objective doesn't have to match that. It can be higher. It can be better, right? And maybe it's more efficient. Maybe part of your cold calling strategy is calling across an organization in a dedicated period of time. So you have this buyer or that buyer, but you don't know all the influencers or decision makers, or there's new products coming out and they pertain to a different part of your customer's business. That's still legitimate calling. And those are calls that people can put off making because again, you're calling new people, you're talking to strangers. At the end of the day, if you're gonna be successful in sales, and I'm not the classic type A, super social over the top sales guy, never happened, right? I get by on facts and figures and working relationships. Find the style and the system that works for you, but at the end of the day, without the customer contact, without the customer exposure, you're not going to be successful in sales. Thanks for listening. Once again, if you liked what you heard, please subscribe. Apple Podcasts, Spotify. We also have a YouTube channel now under Tim Kubiak, so you can check that out, and the links are in the show notes. Talk to you next week. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you've enjoyed this episode. We put out fresh content every Tuesday. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, tell your friends, and share on your own social media accounts. Want us to see what you have to say? It's a BYOB kind of party. Bring your own bow tie. So hashtag bring your own bow tie. Our listeners are important to us. After all, it's you we create this content for. With that in mind, we're doing a mailbag episode once a quarter. If you have suggestions, ideas, or questions you'd like answered, email us at mailbag at bowtiesandbusiness.com. This show is produced, edited, and researched by Courtney Kubiak with the help of her rescue dogs, Tequila Rose and Rooney.